Okay, so uh, we just talked about some of the communicable disease stuff and the rashes that come along with that. But sometimes we can have um, you know, significant wounds that occur as a result of something that's infectious or contagious. So just to kind of do a little refresher with you, remember the factors that are going to influence how the skin is going to be able to heal. So for improved healing, we want a moist, uh, crust-free environment. That is really going to improve you know, the healing abilities of the skin, from you know, whether it be a wound or a rash where the skin is broken open whatever it is. Uh, we know that poor wound healing is going to occur with people who have um, a nutritional deficiency. Specifically, those that we're very concerned about are vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin C, uh, low protein, and low zinc. So those who aren't getting enough of those things in their diet are not going to heal as well. Stress is a huge factor in wound healing. So those who have a higher level of stress will have um, an increase in the release of catecholamines um, that cause uh, vasoconstriction and that reduces the blood flow to areas that are in need of healing and slows the healing process. Infection, of course, if we have um, a wound or an incision or something like that, if it becomes infected, of course, that's going to um, you impact the body's ability to heal. It's going to increase the inflammation and increase the risk for tissue damage in that area of the body. There are many uh, disease processes that uh, you know, impact uh, wound healing. As you already know, uh, diabetes is one of those. Um, anemia, you know, peripheral vascular disease, uh, and uremia. All of those you know, conditions are going to decrease the body's ability to heal um, or extend the length of time it's going to take for them to heal. I mean, circulation is important. So anything that's going to influence or reduce uh, the circulation to the body is going to impact the ability to heal. That um, you know, directly results in a reduced supply of nutrients um, at the cellular level, and then those cells cannot heal as well. So how do you know that a wound or an incision or some type of break on the skin within the body is infected? You should already know this, but I'm going to do a quick little review for you just to refresh your memory. So what we'll generally see is a redness and a little pink right at the margins of the wound is normal, but we don't want to see that redness extend beyond the wound margins. That really um, is indicating to us that the inflammation is more severe and could potentially indicate an infection. Swelling or edema, it you know can be indicative of infection. Uh, you know, purulent, purulent exudate, excuse me, or pus. Um, so, you know, the green stuff, the smelly stuff, the ooziness. Uh, you know, those things will indicate that we have an infection going on. We'll see an increase in pain at the incision or wound site when there's an infection, and the skin will become warm to the touch, or you know, even sometimes you don't even need to touch it, but just being near that area of the body, you can feel the heat as it emanates from the wound that is infected. Now remember your basics of wound care. You want to wash the wound or the injured area of skin with very mild soap and water and rinse it thoroughly. We want to avoid anything on the skin that is going to irritate it or cause more inflammation. So we want to avoid things like uh, povidone, iodine, uh, alcohol, you know, hydrogen peroxide. Those things are really uh, toxic to the skin cells and can damage healthy tissue. We want to uh, cover an open wound uh, just to prevent the spread of any infection. You want to leave a wide margin of intact skin around the dressing um, and then remove the dressing if any leakage uh, is occurring and remove the dressing very carefully so as not to irritate the, uh, the skin where the dressing was attached. Um, it can be very helpful to have the child you know, participate in wound care. They can help open packages. They can help to remove the old dressing. There are things that they can do to assist and become involved, which makes them uh, much more cooperative in the process of wound care. Um, the, if we can reduce the frequency of dressing changes, that will help 
uh, decrease the risk of contamination and decrease the irritation to the skin. So the least number of times we have to tear off a dressing or peel it off the skin, the less irritated the skin's going to be and the less you know, opportunity we're going to have to introduce germs into that wound. So we want to change the dressing if it needs to be changed, but we don't want to be too aggressive with the number of dressing uh, changes that we're providing to our patient. We also want to remember what types of symptoms that we're going to have on our patients um, who have a skin condition of some type, you know, communicable disease, wound, all of that. As the skin heals, um, it's very common that our you know, patients are going to complain of itching. Kids are especially sensitive you know, to itchiness when it occurs and really, really likely to scratch. So we want to think about that and provide interventions that are going to reduce the opportunity for the child to scratch those itches. Um, so we can provide them with uh, cool baths or compresses that sometimes will help with comfort. Uh, baking soda baths or with some conditions an oatmeal bath might be appropriate. Those will make the skin less irritated. We really need to prevent scratching. So for the younger children we can put them in little mittens. If you've ever had a newborn baby with long fingernails, you know, we put little socks or mittens on their hands to prevent scratching by accident. But especially when they're itchy, the kids are going to scratch intentionally because they want to make the itch stop. So the mittens work great. Um, it also is helpful to keep the short, or, I'm sorry, to keep the fingernails short and clean so that one, they can't do a lot of damage if they do scratch, and two, if they are able to scratch, they're less likely to introduce germs to the area. But think about how poorly kids do at hand washing at a young age and how difficult it's going to be for them to resist the urge to scratch. And we really need to keep that in mind um, when we're caring for children who are itchy. Um, and again, so the anti-itching medications can be very helpful. So the topical or oral can be helpful. Um, they may present also with pain. It may be more than itching. They may actually have pain. So it wouldn't be inappropriate to provide them with some Tylenol or ibuprofen for that mild to moderate pain. For infections of the skin, we're going to talk about just a couple different things. Um, so we, we, we can have bacterial infections like strep and staph. With staph, we tend to see uh, MRSA. Uh, we can see a lot of abscess formation. And the severity of those types of infections are going to vary significantly based on skin integrity um, and their immune and cellular defenses. Um, Impetigo uh, contagiosa is one of the most common bacterial infections we see in children. It is extremely contagious. Um, so if you think about it for just a minute about bacterial infections that are extremely contagious, which two age groups do you think are going to be more likely to spread this type of bacteria? You guessed it. It's most common in your toddlers and your preschooler ages. Um, they're the ones that are less compliant with hand washing and tend to be really good at sharing germs. Um, so we see an impetigo infection. Um, it can occur anywhere where the skin is broken. Um, it can be something as simple as a scrape, scratch, or insect bite, allowing that bacteria to get into the skin and cause a nasty infection. Uh, the impetigo lesions are, mo are, are mostly located on the face, arms, and legs and one of the hallmarks is intense itching. It can be spread from one area to the other um, on the child's body by self-inoculation. So let's say they have it next to their nose. They can scratch at it and end up like scratching their arm and self-inoculate um, on their arm and now they have it in two locations. Um, so one of the tricks that we've learned is to keep the fingernails short on a child who has something that is itchy so they're less likely to break the skin open and or spread the infection. Um, we want to teach good hand washing. Hand washing is mandatory when you're caring for a child with impetigo. Really, really important. We want to make sure that the child with impetigo has, uh, is provided with separate towels and washcloths from the rest of the family. Uh, PJs um, should be separate from everyone else's. They need to be changed daily and, and washed with hot water and soap. Um, we can also treat 
um, in Pitaigo with topical and, um, and systemic antibiotics. Oh, and I forgot to mention it is more common um, in humid weather. So we don't see a whole lot of impetigo when the weather is very dry. It, it tends to like moist weather. Here you can see a good example of what impetigo contagioso looks like. It's obviously around the nose area. Um, and you can see scabs that have collected there. And then you see some areas that are kind of raw and open looking. And so those raw areas can get a little oozy um, and goopy. And then that um, fluid that kind of like, like oozes out will cause scabs. So we actually want to kind of keep the scabs off. You want to keep it cleaned off and prevent lots of scabs from forming so that it can heal nicely. And the scabs will actually inhibit the healing a little bit. Okay, so now we're going to talk about dermatitis. Um, so more than half of, um, uh, of the skin problems in children are forms of dermatitis. Um, and with dermatitis, we see um, a sequence of inflammatory changes in the skin. Um, the location and manner of these reactions will produce uh, different types of lesions. Um, on the upside, uh, the changes um, that we see with dermatitis are usually reversible, and usually the skin will recover without any blemish. Uh, specifically, diaper dermatitis is seen very often in children. Um, it's usually caused uh, from the irritation of urine and feces on the skin. Um, or from uh, detergents, soaps, and things that are not rinsed well enough from clothing, and can also be caused uh, by chemical irritation, like uh, diaper wipes or the chemicals in the manufacturing of diapers and things like that. Um, some things to consider from a nursing standpoint is that anything that like will alter the level of wetness of the skin, that will alter the pH, and any type of fecal irritant is going to be especially harsh on the skin and could potentially cause the diaper dermatitis. Now this picture is an excellent example of what a diaper dermatitis looks like. What you'll notice is that one, it's very red and irritated. Um, the skin looks really angry. Um, and then the edges of the dermatitis um, are very clearly defined. So essentially, wherever the irritant touched the skin is where you see the redness and inflammation. So it's not like an infection that's going to spread. Whatever part of the skin was touched by the irritant is the area that's affected and nothing beyond that. So all those edges there are probably where the edges of the diaper, at least on the thighs, where the edges of the diaper allowed the skin to be exposed. Um, and then everything that's not red was probably outside of the diaper area. We can also see fungal infections on the skin. Um, so a fungal infection is a superficial infection on the, on the surface of the skin. Um, it's transmitted uh, from person to person or can be transmitted from an infected animal to a person. So examples of this would be um, your candidiasis or thrush yeast infection, uh, tinea capitis, which is ringworm of the scalp, and tinea uh, corporis, which is ringworm of the body. Um, it, it also includes athlete's foot, your tinea pedis, but we aren't going to talk about that specifically. So we'll talk about the thrush and the, and the two types of ringworm. This picture shows um, a candidiasis or yeast infection in the diaper area. And when you compare this to the diaper dermatitis, um, I showed you before, um, you can see that where it's really angry, where uh, the infection or when the where the fungus is um, is more focused, you see a lot of redness. Um, but initially when it started, it looked more like these areas with the little red dots and spots. And what's happened is this, uh, this fungal infection is so severe that those little dots and reddened areas all have run together to create one large reddened area. 
but where the other diaper dermatitis, the edges um, of the infection were very clear, well, uh, or, the, or the irritated area, not infection, were very clearly marked. Here, you have some clear lines, but then outside of those lines, you have a lot of little satellite areas uh, or lesions where you see red dots all over the place, and that is where the fungal infection is spreading its way across the skin. So that is the main difference between when you're seeing a fungal infection versus just a straight up diaper dermatitis uh, from irritation. Ringworm is a fungus. It has uh, strong filaments that invade the hair, nails, and outer layer of the skin. Uh, Tinea capitis and corporis are what we're going to be focusing on here. So remember the capitis is the ringworm of the scalp and the corporis is ringworm on the skin elsewhere on the body. We really want to teach kids about good hygiene. We don't want them to share scarves and hats um, for the capitis and um, can, uh, it's a good idea to inspect family pets who may be carriers of ringworm. Um, we want to be aware of like seats with headrest, bus seats, uh, helmets that may be shared, and mats inside the gym. Um, I can tell you that one of my kids contracted ringworm at a gymnastics birthday party at a gym, and he ended up with, I want to say we had about 26 spots of ringworm um, all over his body, um, but we were able to treat it only with topical. So we can use um, oral, uh, oral antifungals or topical antifungals or uh, a selenium shampoos for a ringworm of the scalp can be very effective. Um, and I'll show you pictures here in a moment. So the photo on the left is showing you a ringworm of the scalp and it looks really gross. It's um, doesn't feel as bad as it looks, but it, it looks like it would be really painful. But you actually will lose the hair around the area that's affected. Um, and then the picture on the right is um, is uh, the ringworm on the body, and you can see how it got its name. Almost looks like a worm in the center surrounded by a ring that is reddened. Um, so, and you can just barely see um, a couple of spots inside um, the underarm and that whole area of the shoulder. And like I told you, my son had 26 spots all over his body from uh, both arms, both legs, trunk, um, everywhere but really his head and neck. But everywhere else on his body, he had spots. So we were really diligent um, with the topical treatment and really on top of it, and it did clear up fairly quickly. But it's kind of, it's super contagious and it's kind of gross to think about that every surface in the house is contaminated um, and how easy it would be to spread. Atopic dermatitis or eczema, you've heard lots about. Um, it is a type um, of pruritic eczema um, that begins in infancy. So um, we know that there is a hereditary tendency um, to getting eczema, it, it does tend to run in families. It is often associated with history of food allergies, um, allergic rhinitis, and asthma. There are three forms of eczema. Uh, there's infantile eczema, which we see beginning between two and six months of age, uh, childhood eczema uh, between ages two and three, and then there's a pre-adolescent and adolescent type of eczema that affects those from ages 12 to early adult. And each one has slightly different look to it um, and different uh, characteristics. Here you can see an example of what your infantile eczema looks like. It um, is very oozy and crusty. We tend to see it a lot on the cheeks. So infantile eczema is usually described as red um, with vesicles or papules that tend to be weeping or oozing and have areas where they've begun to crust, uh, you know, crust over. And then usually around the edges, the skin seems um, somewhat scaly. We tend to see it on the cheeks, scalp, trunk, and extremities. Then the child or adolescent uh, eczema tends to be um, red or flesh colored. Um, and what we see there is papules or scaly dry patches. 
um, so it just has kind of a different look to it. We see it, we tend to see it in the flexural areas, so wrist, ankles, feet, face, and neck are kind of the most common, but you can see it in other places as well. Therapeutic management um, of eczema includes skin hydration, a relief of itching, a reduction of inflammation, and we want to prevent or control secondary infection. So if we already have secondary infection, obviously we don't want it to worsen. Um, or if we have no infection yet, we want to prevent that. Um, and the best way to do that is, pre is to prevent kids from scratching um, wherever they're feeling itchy. So some of the strategies for prevention would be avoiding any irritants or allergens that we know is, uh, is going to lead to a, um, an eczema exacerbation. Um, we can treat with antihistamines. Uh, topical steroids may be effective. Very mild soaps, if any soap at all. And emollient creams will help um, to, keep the, uh, to keep the skin well hydrated and moisturized. Soft cotton clothing will provide them with more comfort. And mild laundry detergents are less likely to irritate the skin. Uh, pediculosis uh, capitis is the medical term for head lice. Um, and I know you're all going to start to scratch and itch now as we're talking about this. Um, it is extremely common, especially in school age children. The most common uh, symptom that we see with head lice is itching. So they'll um, be very itchy and scratch their heads a lot. The adult louse lives for only 48 hours without a human host. And the female louse has a lifespan of about 30 days. The females will lay eggs or nits at the base of the hair shaft. Then within about 7 to 10 days, those nits will hatch. And those little baby lice will um, crawl up the, um, the hair shaft to the scalp where they will feed. And they feed on, um, on human blood. So they'll get a nice little meal there and then they'll start the cycle all over again. We treat uh, head lice. Um, with pediculocides like NYX or one of those, um, I think RID is another one, but there are all different um, brands of uh, treatments for head lice. Um, and then the daily removal of NYX. So we're going to shampoo with the pediculocide and then we're going to actually have to pick out the NYX um, by hand and inspecting the hair shaft um, every single day to get rid of them. Here you can see the live lice actually um, sticking um, to the hair shaft there. So this is highly magnified. They're actually quite small, about the size of a grain of rice. Um, so um, they're pretty easy to spot. Here they, I feel like they kind of blend in with the hair, but it's usually not too difficult to spot them when you're checking for them. And then the nits will actually look like kind of a silvery white, yellow, or even a darker uh, teardrop shaped um, stuck to one side of the hair shaft and, and you'll see a picture of a knit in just a moment. Here you can see on the left is an empty knit case. It's more of a clear type of a color because the knit has already um, hatched out of it. And then on the right here you can see the viable knits are actually inside the knit casing um, still. So they have a bit more of a solid uh, like color and look to it. Preventing the spread and recurrence is extremely important. We want to do a really good job um, in, in um, like inspecting at schools and if anyone um, um, is known to have lice we're going to check that entire classroom and the classrooms of any siblings of that child who was diagnosed with lice. We do lots and lots and lots of teaching. It's important to understand that anyone can get it. It is not something that affects only those who are poor or are dirty. In fact, they actually don't like hair that is oily. So they are really like very clean, straight, fine hair. Um, so they're going to stick better and like that hair. If there's a little bit of oil on it, it's not going to be as easy for them to adhere. 
Um, so the cleaner the hair, the more they like it. In fact, it's most likely found in Caucasian children, which um, tends to be girls more often than boys, and they like straight hair. Um, it is transmitted by the sharing of personal items like combs, hair ornaments, and scarves, um, or kids who are playing very closely together where they're rubbing heads. We see this a lot more with girls. Uh, children can return to school after they've received treatment, and um, we have identified that they are no longer um, infested with lice. We teach parents to wash all washable items in hot water, dry clean anything that can't be washed, um, vacuum the entire house and furniture as thoroughly as possible to pick up any, um, any nets or any lice that may have um, inadvertently gotten left on furniture. And we soak combs and brushes um, in hot soapy water to clean them. Uh, scabies is caused by the scabies mite, um, and what happens here is the female actually burrows into the epidermis uh, where they deposit their eggs and feces. Um, this leads to inflammation of the skin um, that occurs about a month to two months after the initial um, uh, burrowing into the skin. Um, so it actually will leave either reddish or grayish tracks on the skin um, where they're working um, through the epidermis there. Um, we treat with, uh, with topical treatments, um, and there's a couple different medications that we use. You don't have to try to memorize the medications. I, I will not ask you about those. Um, and we can also use uh, a systemic treatment. So um, we can give oral medication if they weigh at least 15 kilos. Here you can see what the what the scabies mite looks like, um, and you can see the skin where the mite has burrowed into the skin, and you can see what that looks like. Um, it, uh, it causes kind of a rash, an itchy feeling, and a crawly feeling is what people will describe. They very much like areas like the genitals, armpits, waistline, hands, and breasts, um, where um, those are kind of, you know, the happy locations on the body for them. And it's spread through physical contact. So we have to have skin-to-skin -skin, uh, contact. So hands are a really good place for them to kind of get started on their journey. On the next few slides, we're going to talk about burns. Um, you get some basic burn information in your critical care lectures. And I'm going to talk really just specifically about burns in the pediatric patient. We see more than 120,000 burn injuries each year in our pediatric population, and it also accounts for 20% of abuse injuries. A burn uh, covering 10% or more of the total body surface area can be life-threatening in children. Um, there are four main types of burns that we see. The majority of the ones um, that will come in for treatment are thermal burns. These are from flames, hot surfaces, and hot liquids. We can also see um, electrical burns, chemical burns, and radioactive burns. Um, the depth of the burn is going to be expressed in degrees, either first, second, or third. And here you can see first, second, and third degree burns. So the first, uh, the first photos are your first degree burns, then your second, and your third. So your first degree burn, so you can see the depth here, it's really only affecting the epidermis. Um, and your second degree burns, it is deeper into the dermis. And um, we see a blistering on the skin and such. And then on your third degree burns, it's going all the way through the dermis, um, affecting deep below the skin surface with severe blistering and injury um, um, and damage to the nerves and follicles. The types of burns that we see by age group um, are as follows. So on the infant, we tend to see a lot of thermal injury, uh, scalding liquids, and house fires. Uh, uh, with our toddlers, we see still a lot of thermal, inner, 
uh, thermal injuries like pulling hot liquids or grease onto themselves. Um, electrical burns can result from biting electrical cords, chemical burns from ingesting cleaning agents and other chemicals. In our preschoolers, we, we see a lot of thermal like scalding and hot appliances. On the school ager, we tend to still see thermal, but it's usually from things like playing with matches, fireworks, um, electrical injuries come like from climbing trees where they may be too close to high voltage wires, um, and chemical burns like combustion experiments. And in the adolescence, we see thermal, chemical, and electrical burns um, and radiation burns because we see a lot more uh, sunbathing um, in this age group. This is what a scald injury looks like, which is the most common in infancy. It can happen from, um, from falling into a bathtub that's too hot, being placed in a bathtub that's too hot, or getting a hold of hot liquids. Here's a burn injury on the mouth uh, from biting an electrical cord where the current um, is actually arcs through the lips, calling a um, uh, uh, causing a full thickness injury. Burn injuries lead to intense vasoconstriction. Um, that leads to ischemia um, that may increase the depth of injury. Um, and when that happens, uh, vasoactive hormones are released, and this actually increases the capillary permeability. After this happens, we see a fluid and plasma shift to the interstitial space, leading to edema and decreased fluid in the vascular space. Um, it's going to take 18 to 36 hours for the capillary permeability to normalize after a burn injury. Um, the, uh, the child's going to lose increased heat and water through the injured epidermis. And we also see an increased metabolic rate and, um, and calories uh, needed to maintain body temperature and begin healing. So there's kind of a lot going on in burn injury. Um, they're at risk um, for going into shock after we see those fluid shifts and decreased fluid in the vascular space. So we kind of really have to be on the lookout um, for those types of complications. Major burns are going to be treated in a specialized burn center. These would be any burns uh, covering more than 10% of body surface area, any full thickness burns, burns on the hands, face, ears, the genitalia, and feet, which tend to be much more painful, any electrical burns, and any inhalation injuries. Your moderate burns can be treated at a hospital that has the ability to provide burn care, and any mild burns can be treated on an outpatient basis. Now the extent of injury is going to be expressed in children by a percent of total body surface area. We do not use the rule of nines in children like we do with adults. Here you can see how those percentages of total body surface area are going to be expressed. Have an infant on the left and a child on the right. Um, you can see, for example, that the front of the trunk is 13% as well as the back of the trunk. The upper arm is 2%, the lower arm is 1%. Um, the hand is one and a quarter percent front and back. Um, now because the head size changes so greatly and the length of the legs is going to change depending on age, that's going to vary um, by their age. So you can see the head is A, the upper legs are B, and the lower legs are C. And you actually have to look at the chart in the bottom left hand corner here to determine that. So A for one half of the head at age one is going to be 8.5%. Um, at an adult it's 3.5%. Okay, so depending on how large the head is, it'll account for a different percentage of the total body surface area. And you can see the same thing with the upper leg and lower leg. So and then the front and the back, you have to account for each of those. So we do not use the rule of nines. Uh, complications from burn injury um, include your... Uh, airway compromise. So we really, um, we always are going to have our airway and breathing um, and circulation as our first priority. Your ABCs are really, really important here. Shock is a risk. Sepsis. Um, 
lower age means we have a higher mortality rate. So the younger the patient, um, the greater their mortality risk is. Um, and lots of pulmonary problems um, as a complication from burn injuries. They're at risk for aspiration pneumonia, pulmonary insufficiency, um, atelectasis, and ARDS. And we also see a lot of wound sepsis. So if we don't do a good job with our wound care, um, we can see um, lots of complications with wounds and infections. A nursing care of the child with a burn injury includes management of shock. Um, and so we need to monitor very closely their vital signs and their eyes and O's. So they're going to be on strict eyes and O's. And we're going to give them IV fluids. And um, so the process for determining how much IV fluid this child's going to need is based on the Parkland formula. So uh, that formula is 4 milliliters times the number of kilos of body weight times the percentage of, of body surface area burned. This will equal the amount of fluid replacement for 24 hours. Then half of this total is going to be given in the first eight hours, and then the remaining half will be spread over uh, the next 16 hours. Um, your, your solutions of choice are going to be lactated ringers or normal saline because those are going to increase the volume uh, the most rapidly. In addition to this, we will also have to give them their normal maintenance fluid. Um, we are going to be, uh, be monitoring their respiratory status, so we, we want to monitor that closely. Uh, cardiac monitoring, especially if we've had an electrical injury, we're more likely to see um, uh, the, uh, the EKG changes. So we really want to watch for dysrhythmias. And then very closely, we, uh, we need to monitor labs, watching for any changes in electrolyte balance. Burns are extremely painful, so it's important to provide our patients with comfort. We want to be almost aggressive in our pain management. We're going to treat them with IV, IV opioids. Um, burn and wound care will be done one to two times daily. Um, we have lots of topical agents we can use um, to help keep the wound clean and prevent infection. Um, and we also can use some silver-based dressings like Aquacel. Um, hydrotherapy can be effective um, for keeping the wounds clean. Um, skin grafting may be done down the road, so you may be caring for patients after skin graft and, uh, with some types of burn injuries. We can even use uh, wound vax on some patients um, to assist with healing. So nutrition is extremely important. Um, as you know, we need good nutrition for healing, lots of protein. So these kids are going to be on a high protein, very healthy diet, making sure they get what they need to provide wound healing. And then our other focus is on preventing complications. Here you can see a child um, who, who had a scald injury. Um, being treated uh, with Aquacel dressing, which is a silver embedded dressing. And you can actually see uh, the exudate um, through the dressing that has been absorbed um, and is visible. Another important piece of the nursing care for the child with a burn injury is assessing for child abuse. There are so many burn injuries that are the result of child abuse that we really need to make sure that um, the story that we're given matches the injury. Um, we need to provide a patient and family support. Um, a play therapy is going to be extremely helpful um, for these children in terms of coping. Um, we, we need to do uh, preparation from surgery if they're going to need surgery. And we also need to take this opportunity to teach prevention before they go home. We really want to make sure that parents know how to keep their child safe in the future. So in order to reduce stress for these children, we're going to pre-medicate um, for pain before we do any dressing changes or interventions. We're going to allow the child to choose the order um, of body parts that are going to be receiving burn care if they have multiple injuries. We're going to allow periods of rest in between our dressing changes. Um, allowing the child to remove the dressings can give them a measure of control. Um, and allow the child to help. We can actually have them hold packages and even open packages 
um, and drop them onto our sterile field. We, you know, they can easily be taught how to open the packages and to participate in, in what's going on. And we always are going to praise a child for their bravery. I don't care if they kick and scream and spit and yell. And, you know, for under any other circumstances, you would say that they were behaving very badly. You are going to tell the child, I am so proud of you. You were so, so brave because we know that it's extremely painful um, for burn care to occur and they're doing the best that they can under the circumstances. And we really want to keep as positive of a focus as we can. Here you can see um, an injury that is related to child abuse, and you'll see another one on the next slide. Um, this is actually um, what we call um, a dip injury. So this child was um, put in some type of hot liquid, probably hot water, and they were actually lowered into the water feet first. And so the reason why we know this is a dip a uh, dip injury related to child abuse rather than an accident is that one both feet are burned so if you have a toddler who goes to step into the bathtub and they put one foot in and it burns them what are they going to do absolutely they're going to pull their foot back they're going to pull right out they're not going to stick their other foot in and stand in hot water that just you know defies all logic um, and the other thing that we'll see is if they fall in, we're not going to see this uniform injury where you can see where the foot was submerged. Um, if they fall in, there's going to be splash marks and the burns are going to be very ununiform in how they present on the child's body. And on this last slide, you can see um, the great injury here. So this child was actually um, had their face pressed to some sort of a grate. Um, could have been like a part of a grill or something like that. Um, I, we've even seen um, burn injuries from children being put in the dryer and it turned on um, and the vent on the back will leave kind of um, a waffle pattern on their skin, um, which is so, so awful to think about, but we definitely see these types of injuries. And so you always want to look at the injury and, and listen to the story and say, well, does that make sense? And if your gut is telling you that something isn't right, then you need to take those next steps and report it. Because we, the last thing we want to do is send a child home to a situation that's going to uh, put them um, at greater risk. Otitis media, it's just a fancy name for ear infections. What I'm going to be talking about is acute otitis media, which is an ear infection um, that's associated with fever. Uh, the clinical manifestations for, for ear infections are pulling at the ear, uh, irritability, crying, waking at night, diarrhea and vomiting, and of course fever. So the older the child is, the more they'll be able to, um, to describe what they're feeling and what their symptoms are. But we typically see ear infections in younger children. And so for them, if they're not uh, able to express with words um, what they're feeling, we have to look for those symptoms. So um, a lot of kids will not even just pull at their ear, but bat at their ear. Um, and then ju just that you know, overall, um, not feeling good, you know, irritability type of stuff. Um, and the way we diagnose an ear infection is by looking at the tympanic membrane. Um, a visual inspection can give us a lot of information. Um, as you're aware, a normal tympanic membrane should be kind of a pearly gray color, uh, translucent. It should reflect light when we shine a light in the ear. And you should be able to see the inner bones just a little bit through the eardrum. When we have an acute otitis media, uh, the tympanic membrane um, can look a couple of different ways. Um, we usually see it look really red. Um, sometimes it's described as like a beefy red, kind of like raw beef. Um, sometimes it's more of a yellow color, and sometimes it's green um, due to uh, pus that can build up behind it. So um, we kind of see a variety of, uh, um, of presentations and what the tympanic membrane looks like.
The reason why we see more ear infections in very young children is because of the anatomy of the ear. Picture A shows a child's eustachian tube and picture B shows an adult tube. So if you look back at picture A for just a second, on the left you see the outer ear and then you can see the ear canal. And the eustachian tube, again, is that tube that connects the ear to the throat and allows for drainage. So in, um, in the child's ear, it's very flat, um, so we don't have a good, a good angle for drainage. The older um, a person gets, the more the eustachian tube becomes angled and steep. Uh, which will facilitate drainage. So adults don't get ear infections as frequently as children because our anatomy is um, is such that it facilitates a drainage of any infection, fluid, that type of thing. So um, it's not just the flat tube that'll increase the chances, but once we get any irritants in the ear or germs in the throat, you'll you. You can also see these that the eustachian tube is very short in children, meaning that germs don't have to travel very far from the throat to the ear to get in there. And once they cause infection, uh, the eustachian tube becomes inflamed, swollen, and it's much easier to block that passageway. Here you can actually see uh, the fluid and inflammation that goes along with an ear infection. Over on um, the right, you can see the ear canal and uh, the tympanic membrane, and uh, you can see fluid that's built up behind. So normally that would drain out. However, because we have inflammation inside of the eustachian tube, it makes it difficult for that fluid to drain out, becomes trapped, and puts a lot of pressure on the eardrum. There are a few things that can increase the risk of a child uh, like contracting an ear infection. Uh, a pacifier use can lead to the backflow of secretions, um, meaning it allows fluid to back up the eustachian tube into the eardrum, and bottle use also will increase that backflow. Children who go to daycare are more likely to get ear infections. Exposure to secondhand smoke increases the risk. Any craniofacial abnormalities um, any problems with the sinuses or anything abnormal in the bone structure can also be a contributing factor. Um, allergies, so children who have a lot of seasonal allergies um, and food allergies are more at risk um, for frequent ear infections. And boys are more likely than girls to, uh, to get ear infections. Pharyngitis is an inflammation of the pharynx, and we're gonna talk more specifically about strep throat. There are a few different causes of pharyngitis. Strep throat accounts for about 10 to 20% of those sore throats, and it's caused by group A beta hemolytic strep. It's very important that we treat strep. Um, it can also lead to scarlet fever, and that's the name we give it when we have a rash that accompanies the strep throat. This also can lead to rheumatic fever, which, um, can uh, can damage the heart and lead actually to permanent heart valve damage. And it can also lead to acute, acute glomerulonephritis. So uh, glomerulonephritis is generally uh, post-infectious. So, and this is one of the main causes and that can lead to kidney damage. Although most children, if treated, will recover from that. Viral infections account for 80 to 90% of those sore throats. So more often than not, it's not strep throat, but we always wanna be safe and make sure that we treat it if it is. Some of the clinical manifestations that we see with strep throat are headache, fever, abdominal pain, tonsils, and the throat becomes red and inflamed. So not every child has all of those, but we typically see fever with strep throat, um, and then the throat symptoms are really obvious. Um, it'll hurt to swallow. Um, sometimes when we look at the throat, we'll see big pockets of pus actually sitting on the tonsils. Um, can be extremely painful and can make kids really, really sick. And this can progress to tonsillitis. Strep throat requires a diagnostic evaluation. Um, even though most are caused by viruses, we want to make sure we do a throat culture um, and test for strep. And it's important to remember that 
once we know that it's strep and we begin antibiotic therapy, that they're contagious for 24 hours before the antibiotics get that infection under control enough that they can be exposed to others. First-line drugs include penicillins, um, like amoxicillin and augmentin. You don't see a lot of, um, of penicillin being uh, prescribed anymore for strep throat. You usually see some uh, derivative of penicillin. Second-line drugs would be your cephalosporins, like Omniceph or um, azithromycin or um, z and, um, and these are used more often if we have an allergy to penicillin in our patient or if um, we suspect it's a resistant strain or we've tried penicillins and it hasn't been effective. Uh, nursing care management of someone with strep throat includes warm or cold compresses to the neck. We would recommend to, to do whichever provides them um, with some comfort, with some relief. And uh, warm saline gargles can be very effective. Of course, we can only do that with kids who are old enough to gargle. Um, so for our older children, that can be helpful. Um, and then we recommend that children have cool liquids and ice chips that can be very soothing to the throat. So strep throat can lead to tonsillitis, as I mentioned before. Um, so let's talk about that for a minute. So the tonsils um, are lymphoid tissue in the throat that filter and protect um, the body from respiratory and GI infection. It also helps with the formation of antibodies. So we've progressed to tonsillitis when we kind of have this, uh, this chronic inflammation or infections that are extremely frequent or, um, or even back to back. Sometimes we'll uh, prescribe with antibiotics then um, the infection will you know, get better, the child will, will be doing okay. Then within a few days of stopping the antibiotics, they start getting sick again. Uh, physically, um, some, some of the things that we see um, are kissing tonsils. That's where the tonsils are so inflamed that they actually touch in the throat. This can cause children to gag or completely obstruct their airway. Um, this results in difficulty swallowing. Um, and one of the other symptoms uh, would be mouth breathing and snoring because their airway is so compromised, they make a lot of noise. Therapeutic management for tonsillitis is, um, is a tonsillectomy, which is removal of the tonsils. So this would be indicated if we have a peritonsillar abscess or if we're having an airway obstruction. So the tonsils are kissing, they're having trouble breathing or snoring at night. Um, in addition to that, if we have a child with three or more infections of the tonsils or adenoids in one year, they then meet the criteria for a tonsillectomy as well. That doesn't mean we have to give, um, you know, do a tonsillectomy because they've had three infections, but those kids would, um, would meet the criteria. Here is a lovely picture of tonsillitis. So you can see the inflamed tonsils um, on, uh, like on either side of the throat behind the tongue. And you can see white, uh, some white exudate on the tonsils. And that's that pus I was talking about, those pus pockets that can build. And likely the entire tonsils are filled with this pus. And what we're seeing on the outside is really just a little bit of that infection that is simmering and brewing inside the tonsils. When a tonsillectomy is performed, what we're taking out is the palatine tonsils, and those are um, kind of you know the oval-shaped larger tonsils um, right in the back of the throat. Sometimes when they take tonsils, they'll also take out the adenoids, which are the ones kind of at the top there on the back of the throat um, between the, uh, the nasal cavity and throat, um, and those um, can be a contributing factor to infections. Um, a lot of the body's allergy response occurs from the adenoids. So especially if we have a child who has a lot of ear infections, um, they'll take out the adenoids as well as the tonsils. That's why we call it um, a tonsillectomy and, and adenoidectomy. Um, sometimes when they put in tubes, they'll take out the adenoids as well, but typically we'll leave the tonsils intact. The nursing care management for a child um, after a tonsillectomy includes a liquid to soft diet. Um, we'll start them with some ice chips after surgery, and within a you know, couple of hours, they should be able to drink liquids and should be able to advance them to a, a soft diet within a, a couple of hours, unless they're having nausea. 
Um, we also may try a cool mist vaporizer to provide them a little bit of comfort um, and ease the pain in their throat. Warm saltwater gargles can be helpful once they've begun some healing um, and the throat is no longer quite so raw. The salt um, provides um, some antibiotic protection, help to keep the wound clean and minimize swelling. Um, we can also try throat lozenges a little later down the line to provide a little comfort as well. Uh, medications that are typically seen um, or used on a child after tonsillectomy um, is pain medication. It's extremely painful to have a tonsillectomy, although they tend to recover very quickly. Um, you'll usually see prescribed for them either Tylenol with codeine or Lortab Elixir, which is a hydrocodone, uh, hydrocodone acetaminophen uh, combination med. Um, some kids don't uh, respond well to codeine. I would say that I usually see Lortab uh, prescribed more often than not. Um, we also will treat with antipyretics. Obviously, there's Tylenol in uh, the pain medicine, so we won't do anything in addition to that. But once their pain's not as bad, we could probably just switch them over to some regular Tylenol um, and get rid of the narcotic. Um, we're not going to use any EDSED, NSAIDs as this will increase the risk of bleeding. Also, if they're having nausea, we're definitely going to give them some antiemetics. We don't want to risk that um, that a child who's recovering from this type of surgery is going to vomit. It's extremely painful anyway. And then to have to throw up um, after you've just had surgery on your throat is really excruciating. Um, you know, Postoperatively, the child is going to be positioned on their side or abdomen until they're awake. Then they can sit up and move around um, in whatever position is comfortable for them. But if they're on their side or abdomen, this allows us to see any blood that may trickle um, out of their mouth. So if the bleeding starts and they're laying flat on their back and they're not really alert yet, they're going to just sit there and swallow all that blood um, and eventually they're going to throw it up. And we want to make sure that we catch any bleeding early so we can do something about it. Um, we also instruct them not to cough if they can avoid it, um, not to blow their nose. We want to prevent straining and we won't let them use straws. So when you suck on a straw, it, inc um, it increases uh, the, the negative pressure in the throat and can pull free any clots that may be uh, beginning to form. Um, and we don't want them straining, so you want to keep them really well hydrated so that when they have a bowel movement, they don't have to work really hard um, and put strain on their throats. They may also have some dark brown drainage, which is very typical as that um, as those wounds begin to scab and heal over, um, they're going to have a little bit of dried blood in there. When it mixes with saliva, they're going to end up with that old blood type drainage. Um, it's normal for them to have foul breath, ear pain, and low-grade fever. Um, the same nerves that feed um, the ear are also connected to the throat. So pain in the throat can be referred to the ear and ear pain can be referred to the throat. Um, so if they complain of ear pain, that is the same thing as them saying that their throat hurts. Um, a low-grade fever means anything below um, like 101 would be considered low-grade. Surgeons don't consider a fever a true fever until we're about 101.5. So then there's kind of that gray area where you might want to watch and see. But at 101.5, we absolutely need to call the surgeon and report it. Um, the child is also at risk for hemorrhage, of course, um, uh, because of the area that we've done surgery on. It's highly vascularized, um, so we're going to be on the lookout for any bright red, fresh blood. Um, we're going to watch for frequent swallowing um, as a sign that they maybe are swallowing blood and don't realize they're bleeding. Um, and tachycardia and pallor, as you know, would indicate that we might have a bleed going on somewhere. As they lose volume, their, their heart rate is going to go up and they become pale with that loss of blood. So those are kind of our cardinal you know, signs that we really want to watch for that are um, you know, really indicative of a problem. You also want to keep suction equipment and oxygen at bedside as a precaution. Since we had surgery in the throat, um, there is a risk um, of losing that airway, of course. So we want to be prepared for that just in case. Um, we are going to put an ice collar on if needed or uh, some cool compresses. can provide a little bit of comfort. You want to avoid heat. Heat could be really dangerous because it vasodilates. And with that vasodilation, we have an increased risk of bleeding. So cool is the only kind um, of comfort you can provide around the neck area. And then um, food and fluid will be restricted until the child's awake. And like I said, once they're awake, 
We'll start them uh, with ice chips and cool water, advance them to things like popsicles and diluted fruit juice, and then advance their diet as normal. With the foreign body aspiration, um, we may have a child who presents um, with a caregiver where they can give us a history where they witnessed um, a coughing, gagging, or choking episode that may be associated with feeding or crawling on the floor. We say crawling on the floor because sometimes we don't see a baby picking something up and putting it in their mouth. It could be something like a Lego or a Barbie shoe or something like that. Um, we may also have something that wasn't witnessed at all where the child just presents uh, with, with diminished breath sounds, uh, strider, or respiratory distress. These are all going to be suspicious for a non-witnessed aspiration, and that will need to be ruled out. 15% of foreign bodies are radiopaque, meaning we'll be able to see them on x-ray, but the majority of them are organic in nature. This makes it uh, difficult to locate those obstructions. Uh, a forced expiratory film, that's a film um, where they're going to be able to watch the lungs uh, you know, deflate as they exhale out. may show some hyperinflation um, wherever the obstruction is at. And sometimes even a mediastinal shift away from the affected shot side. Any object lodged, lodged in the trachea is considered life-threatening, so you immediately want to start your CPR techniques with back blows and chest thrusts or abdominal thrusts. Um, once we locate the object or suspect um, that they have a foreign body, they can do a fiber optic bronchoscopy or fluoroscopy to locate and extract the foreign body. I once had a two-year-old um, who was having uh, all these episodes of, of, of pneumonia, and they were trying to figure out what the cause was, and um, they actually ended up doing a bronchoscopy, and they actually found um, hamburger, a, a big chunk of hamburger that the child had been eating, and you know they aspirated it, but he was able to breathe around it. Uh, didn't really trigger his gag and cough reflex, so the parents didn't realize. And when they went to pull it out um, with the bronchoscopy tools, it actually like crumbled and fell apart. And it took them a really long time to get all that out of of the lung. As the nurse who's caring for a child with a foreign body aspiration, um, they need to be constantly monitored, monitored for increased distress. We need to watch their vital signs. We need to check for an altered level of consciousness. We want to observe for audible breathing, which of course will be kind of obvious because you'll be able to hear it. Um, the breath sounds may change from normal to decrease to absent. So as that foreign body can shift around and, um, and end up in a different spot, their breath scene sounds may change. Um, we put them on a cardiorespiratory monitor, uh, meaning um, we have them on a heart monitor. So it's going to pick up other respirations as well as their heart, um, their heart rhythm, so that we can uh, keep an eye on all of that and make sure there's, uh, there are no major changes. And we'll put them also on a pulse, pulse oximeter, and we want to make sure their SATs stay greater than 95%. It's also really important we keep the child calm. They tend to get um, really anxious when they can't breathe. They get that you know deer in the headlights kind of glassed over look um, with that distress. And so it's really important that we keep them calm and that we keep our faces calm so we don't work them up. We need to always be prepared for complete obstruction. So at any minute, whatever's lodged in there can shift and completely obstruct the airways. So we want to be uh, you have our code cart nearby and everything we need just in case. And really the most important thing with foreign body aspiration is teaching of prevention and safety. So we want to do an excellent job when we're educating new parents before their baby is able to roll and crawl and put things in their mouth. We want to do um, a good job of teaching so they know what to do to baby proof, proof and keep their child safe.